Uh, you've been busy, haven't you? Yes, I have. Um, and the topic we'll talk about is really what's been keeping most of my time these days is right. occupying that and it's religious exemptions or any yeah. exemptions for the matter. And I can imagine that's probably a question that a lot of people have on their minds right now. Yes, um, and the Slavic folks especially. And the, t the question obviously we're talking about uh, the COVID mandate or vaccine mandate, right? Yes. yes. So you've been very busy helping a lot of folks, youth, older folks who are in danger of losing their job, is that correct? Correct, yeah. I mean, not all of them were condition of employment. I think just in general, the mandate of getting a vaccine and um, a lot of employers, especially within the last two weeks when we went to 100 plus employees for an employer, I think that ramped up more work for me than it did even before then. Um, because it was just healthcare for the beginning and then now we're, we're faced with almost everybody has to have an exemption or a vaccine. Yeah, especially since Biden came out and uh, said essentially now Correct. businesses, private businesses uh, are going to have to enforce it. Yep. So that's going to be uh, difficult for a lot of folks. And I know some folks are coming out and not supporting it, uh, some supporting it. So it's kind of a mixed thing. So we're here to just kind of bring a little bit of light of it because it's definitely a lot of information out there. Some are wrong, some are good. So mm -hmm. it would be good to discuss that as well. Um, so we're both have been kind of working on this a little bit. You've obviously been a lot busier. Yes. <laughs> uh, I've been helping a little bit through our through my work uh, where I work at Freedom Foundation, and there's some support there. But um, I think what you've been doing is probably most effective on the individual level. Yes, and I my journey began actually with pastors. So I started with church. Right. Um, so when it first started COVID mandate. Um, churches did not know how to navigate that process so the first thing i did was i contacted alliance of freedom they're in a firm that i work with um and i said what do churches do right what is that language that they need to be simplified can they even be issuing these can i take a position on you know vaccines um and so that's really where we started is we're churches and then really tackled to members and now we're talking about employees right. and um, employers so not just churches but that's where we begin right well uh, before we jump in too far let's st start off with introductions because some yes. people might know you might be surprised for, for for you but there's people out there probably don't know you never heard of you so could you speak a little bit of who you are uh just briefly and just go over your um just your history i guess yeah thanks for that um yeah my name is lily and i am I'm a start here, a consultant. So I did start a consulting firm and that's why I'm pretty much the busiest right now is because I have um, a business where I help folks and a lot of those are gonna be solving community. Um, I also launched a, a partnership organization, you can call it, it's called SV Action, where I do a little bit more political work now. I'm not as educational. I actually have the freedom to tell people who to vote for. I also oversee a, a private school um, at my church in Vancouver and that definitely has kept me busy um we've gone from you know having 30 students to 120 students and up so that's been the biggest um project that i've also worked on i do work on all sorts of various projects throughout the time but i would say those are the things that keep me busy at the current season i'm also a student um, trying to get a law degree as well as a master's um so i'm always part of a legal field so you'll be uh, one of the few future lawyers here in slavic community Yes. Well, I'm learning there's more than I've ever thought before. I am learning, but I think a lot of them do not focus on religious freedom or nonprofit or church work. A lot of them are immigration based. So I will be probably one of the few in this area, or maybe there's some that I just haven't met. But for the most part, I will say as far as religious freedom and church work, I will be one of you. And that's right. my focus. The only other person that I know that I can think of um, is Sheila. She was on with us a few months ago. She currently uh, works with Freedom Foundation, and she's essentially does a freedom, you know, religious she a freedom. Slavic? She's a Slavic, okay. yeah. So uh, we had a really good program. We talked a little bit about the unions and what they do, but uh, she's she was a very smart lady, and okay. um, um, awesome. that was that was good to have her on. Yeah, and she focuses on pro nonprofit as well, or uh, well, she's she kind of comes from everywhere. She started. Okay. Uh, she's she's done a lot of private sector, and then okay. now she's at in the public. Uh, in public sector or okay. specifically nonprofit. Okay. Um, so if anybody is interested to hear that, let, you know, w you can find that episode. I believe it's episode 12. Uh, you can find that on our YouTube page and, and catch up on that. But um, what made you want to get into law and uh, just in general that whole, because that's a very difficult thing. And I uh, just, what, what, would, <sighs> what would you 
How yeah, would you describe fun, that? fun journey. Actually, I've known since I was five. Um, I did a great job arguing with my brothers all the time. So my parents always said I'd make a great attorney. I never gave up. Um, and then I obviously I studied law throughout my life. I've always got reinforcements um, as I kept on studying that law was my place. And it's always good to, I think one of the things coming from Ukraine, where, where I was born, coming here, and one of the things looking at my parents, I always wanted to know how do I protect myself legally? Like as I got pulled over by, you know, uh, law enforcement or my brothers, and when every time I interacted with that process, it always made me sad that we didn't know our rights. We didn't know that we don't have to hand over our cell phone, right? When that first cell phone law came out, everybody freaked out because they thought law enforcement can just take your phone to see whether or not you were on it to give you a criminal punishment. And that was the moments, like little things like that. I was like, I would always want to know the law. I want to know when I'm being, you know, asked to do something, especially right now with mandates, right? An employer approaches you and tells you your day ends tomorrow or you have to leave your shift. The situation I feel with people today when I face them and I talk with them is they didn't know that they didn't have to leave that. They didn't know that they could have said no. They didn't know that they had something or that Title VII is so much broader than just protection under the law, you know? And so it's one of those reasons every day I'm enforced that knowing law just for individual purposes, like knowing when you can say no, knowing when you have the right for something is so much more valuable and incredible because in the current political environment we live in, if you do not, you're gonna get taken over they're going to take over your rights unless you can say no that's not right right but you have to know it well you mentioned title nine i'm sure a lot title of people seven, yeah. title seven uh i'm sure a lot of people don't know what that is could you briefly kind of explain it yes title seven is what is given to everybody in the cu current situation so it applies to the mandates but title seven is just really protection of not being discriminated for different reasons one of them is religion um, so an employer cannot, you know, not offer you a job. They cannot offer you a certain benefit because of your sex, race, or your ethnicity, right? And so Title VII is so much broader than that, but that's in a nutshell of what it is. Um, and the biggest application right now is the COVID mandate, and Title VII is what people rely on. Is that the same thing as law enforced by EEOC? Equal employment opportunities a little bit. They do have a lot more rules under the Title VII, but they also have a lot other rules that, protect more or less okay um, so it does cover EOC and we'll talk about that that's one of the things agencies a lot of people go have gotten to learn because that's one of the things we've had to do during appeals is going through EOC because before an attorney can take a case where you feel like you've been discriminated under title 7 which is a federal law you have to file with an EO EEOC and for them to identify that it, it was in fact discrimination mm, okay well so obviously a lot of folks are listening, they're going to be faced with that yes. question. Uh, what would you recommend uh, them doing? So we'll probably start with that and, and going for, you know, what, what, what are the steps do they have in order to overcome that if that's an option? So, and when you say as in far as if they're told that they have to get vaccinated? Vaccinated and then, or in general, you know, you either get vaccinated or you lose essentially your lose okay. your job. Yeah. So condition of employment, huge, huge thing. So um, one of the things, so everybody that is faced with that, I mean, one of the things you want to know is, yes, you have the protection under Title VII to give you that, but there is a process. For example, an employer cannot just say you have to get vaccinated and that's it. They have to offer you options. So common options we see employers will, because at the end of the day, employers do get freedom to decide. Um, there, I am faced with a lot of employers that are private that unfortunately do not offer a religious exemption. However, they offer medical or something else. For example, does that apply both uh, private and and public sector? So public does have to offer religious exemption. Private Every not? Pro private, not necessarily. No. Um, so employees that are faced with that. So one, it, it's always a case by case. For example, every employer will go as far as too extreme or so open. For example, I have had employers that are just like, hey, we just need you to write an exemption because you're already 100% remote, but I just need something on record, right? Um, versus we've had folks, you know, employers that are like, no, I not only do I want to know your beliefs, I want your pastor to confirm that you hold those beliefs, right? And all of those, in the beginning of the process, I will say all of those felt unreasonable. They felt too far because Title VII doesn't we don't have to go to prove something, right? But 
Unfortunately, what we've learned is during emergency powers and mandates such as this, they can go as far as that. Mm. And it is not something we can simply go off of that and go to court. We need more than that. Um, and so first things to do is ask your employer. I would always encourage people, always be kind in this process. One of the things that I know for Slavic folks especially, it's so hard. I mean, I get it. Having to tell, like, prove your religion or prove your medical, you know, your medical history to get an exemption, I know is tough, but be kind. I think that helps a lot of folks. And then ask them the process. And most of the time, what you'll get is it'll be something very general, like submit a letter. You know, some employers will give you 12 questions because they want to know specifics. Such questions can include have you had a vaccinations before? Have you had a religious exemption before? Have your viewpoints changed? When was the day you got baptized? Where was the day you, you know? They will go as extreme. So it varies uh, by Do they have it. to answer those questions? They do. They do have to answer those questions. Uh, otherwise, it's incomplete, right? Mm. They won't get the exemption. So again, a lot of it in regular circumstances, as I talk to attorneys weekly, we say that is illegal. No employer should be asking that. In the current, it is not. Hmm. Unfortunately, yeah, emergency powers, right? The president has used his emergency power. Every governor is using their emergency power to do those proclamations, to do those orders um, that unfortunately go far beyond um, what even the Constitution says. But it's it's the, during the emergency power. That's why it's so important. I know two years ago we had in Washington a ballot measure asking people on how much emergency power they were willing to give to Governor Inslee. And that was a really look down question. It wasn't very, people didn't take it as serious. And I think right now as people were hitting, and this was probably 2019, I want to say, election. Um, and I think people now look at, look at that. If, let's say, that ballot measure now came up, I think people would look at it differently because now they'd understand what emergency power is, right? It's absolute, there is no limit. You don't know what the government's going to do. Um, and so when you say yes to a ballot measure like that, uh, what you're saying is, hey, do it, you know, I'm not going to control right. you because you can't, right? So it is a measure that passed in Washington, and we've seen it be far extended, right? During COVID, we've seen the governor take action absolutely unconstitutional. Um, and we currently continue to see that. But unfortunately, we can't go back. It's very convenient that it was so close yes. to. <laughs> Absolutely. Sometimes I think of that as like, was that a setup of some sort? Right. But it's also realism for people as they vote. Um, I know that sometimes we look at it and we're like, oh, fire department is just asking us, you know, for 20 more years of our bond, whatnot. Right. But thinking about that, what does that mean in circumstances? And I know we don't know the future. That's why consulting organizations like Slavic Vote is good because you've got hopefully experts that are advising you. And if you don't know, ask, always ask someone because voting in measures like this is where we get ourselves into so much situations like now right. where we've got an emergency power proclamation because of COVID and we don't have much way, but having to answer those 12 verbiage though, I will say, right. And you've seen True. that Most we've had time, a, yeah. the sex education thing that yeah. the verbiage really threw people off and people voted opposite right? because they wanted to vote no, but the way it was verbed, they should have voted yes. Right. So it's always, yeah, you got to look at it like exactly. what's the verbiage because people now do understand right to graduate, which is great. I mean, awesome. I wish I had that in my high school time. But it's also like, right, so peop people are going to think, oh, it's always a no, and then they're going to vote no, and then it should be a yes. So always tricky on that too, right. and they know so that. So basically, when in doubt, vote no. <laughs> <laughs> the best. Probably a good yeah. strategy. Yeah. Not always. Right. Or, or when in doubt, reach out to Slavic Vote. Yes, absolutely. Th I think that's a better. You should that's do that better. first step that's and right. then do no. Oh. Is that right now during the emergency power or before the emergency power? Correct. No, you can still because it, but again, it's case by case. So what have they, have you received prior communication from HR? Very important. A lot of people are like, well, I got let go yesterday. And I was like, well, has there been communication? Did you get a notice of a policy change from HR? Did you get a notice? Um, it's, it's all about that because you haven't been given any, even the proclamation. And for example, in the Washington states, there's timelines established, right? We have till October 15th to get things like employer cannot just tell you no but there needs to be sufficient i've had an individual actually two weeks ago who did not get anything he just actually it was during lunch break he went out to lunch came back where his monitors were turned off and he was not able to log in um and in, in uh, attorneys that took on the case had a really easy time going forward because not only did he not get sufficient time he was 
during a shift, a middle of a shift. It wasn't even an end of a shift. He just arrived and it was all disconnected. Um, so things like that, in those situations, you definitely want to say no and get that in writing. So um, one of the things we did talk with him and I said, you need to follow up with your HR and let them know, you know, what occurred. So they have it in writing because they can, you have to have had a sufficient notice and timeline um, and then you can confidently say no. Right, right. And, and we, was, we briefly, briefly talked about the Title VII. Uh, uh, can you maybe go over a little bit? What Title VII, I mean, it does two things. One, you cannot refuse to hire based on um, sex, religion, ethnicity, things like that. So very basic. So that's the first one. The second one is it covers you can't you cannot an employer based on your sex, right? So you won't an employer cannot take something against you. Um, under those conditions. So that's why Title VII comes in play when we're talking about religious exemption, when we're talking about medical, right? Because an employer cannot take fire you, that's an adverse action, um, without have giving you an opportunity, right? Without Where people will associate Title VII is with hiring and then adverse action. So there, an employer cannot just do something out of the norm under your protected class. Right, right. Do you feel like, and it got extended in some areas. Okay. Um, I know Washington, that got extended as well. So do you feel like it's going to be just com constantly con extending? Or do you think they're actually going to take the action and actually... Ask me, well, is there hope, right? What, it, what happens after here? I think what we're seeing with extensions is two things. One, employers have realized the impact, and they're speaking to the government about it, right? For example, Peace Health in Washington, right, where there's shortage on nurses, where their emergency hours have gone from three to six. So there is that's that's really impactful. Um, um, it's not. You can't do three-day, 17-hour shifts. Um, in fact, even my mom got a call from a gal who does cleaning at a hospital, and she said um, not only are they looking, they're paying them three hundred dollars almost for it for two hours just an additional on top of overtime that they've capacity um and so eventually what we're seeing with the extent agencies level right they're also a required class right now to get vaccinated he's also seen that in every in, in fact i think in general all um every agency every government is seeing that because you just cannot hire that quickly there's a huge profit loss for businesses because Except religious exemptions, and especially in the healthcare, it's a little bit trickier, um, and we'll touch on that. But what you're seeing is you're going to see profit loss. Clinics aren't able to bill because if you're not seeing a patient, right, you're you're not getting the profit. So not only are businesses and clinics those deadlines, or you got to adjust the policies. And so what I'm seeing right now is two things happening: adjustment in policies. That's one a big one. Like I said, one of the things I'm starting to notice is it used to be remote workers. That also applied in, they're, they're applying it three categories, medical exemption, religious, and if you've already worked remote. So there's a third category that you don't, is not even, you know, within the Title VII. Um, and so employers are recognizing that why, you know, we already have shortage on site. If we're going to have shortage remote, we're really for the automation, like a business, for example, for myself, right? If let's say I had 100 employees let off, a lot of my stuff is automated in my business. So I'd probably do fine if I had to lay off my folks. That's just an example of depending on your business practice. But healthcare, fortunately, can't. So we're going to see adjustment work. I, I, that's what I'm starting. Travel agency, and I want to of something it's the federal agency that oversees travel and they came back they came out with a mandate um, on saying they will accept u.s citizens entering back into u.s just with a negative test so right they were talking about no we're gonna it's gonna have to be yeah, <laughs> right so that's a that's a, that's a change in policy right. right where we heard the debates we heard the conversation we heard a lot of passports we heard a lot about let's make it you know people coming back if they're traveling abroad, not internationally, if they're coming back, maybe we need to require a vaccine. That was a conversation on table, came back saying, we'll just do a negative test. So right. that's a good thing. Giving in, there's just not enough to have that coverage, right? There's not enough people, like where do you find the people that are all f fully vaccinated that you can rehire so quickly? Right. So basically, because I, I hear some people are quitting before mm -hmm. that deadline. And uh, I, I tell people, you know, don't quit essentially don't let you come to the door absolutely yes two things one it impacts unemployment if you get fired you cannot fire for unemployment um in current situation we are dealing with a little bit of a different scenario because it's a leave of absence with right. no deadline however what i have had to do is i've told every single person if you didn't leave and you didn't get fired put on administrative leave leave of absence file unemployment here's the thing why we need to know 
how much people are getting impacted by that so they can reverse. If we don't know, then we can't do anything, right? Because then, okay, it's people, but where are staggering hugely. I'm going to speak for Washington only. I don't know about Oregon just because I have more inner connection with Washington. I know the numbers are going up. And the one thing from that, what has happened last week is I was on a conference call with attorneys and we were talking about the potential great benefit that people is ultimately those people, hopefully, if the lawsuit goes well, because there's lots of lawsuits already starting, including Washington and Oregon, that people can get reimbursed from the day that we're let go. Wow. But you wouldn't know with IRS. It was a really great example. Those nonprofits that didn't get their statuses for years. Um, one thing that happened after in 2016 when the case was won, and actually you know a great person who did that, Jay Sekulow, mm-hmm. was on that case, right? They came back and they got it because they were willing to do the steps to right. get to that point, and that's what we want. Right, so it's very critical to wait for them to take the action you because i know some people just get upset they get mad they get emotional and they want to just leave and mm-hmm. not deal with it but Absolutely. that's strategically a wrong move yes yes if you want to and i always say this to folks and i say at the bottom end is you're gonna leave you're not getting paid greater good not just yourself too you're helping yourself long term because if we don't have these numbers we it's hard for us to do much like Um, we started with people with law firms I was referring to folks to, we started with not having to do the EEOC requirement delay, but it's because the courts, we weren't able to file timely sufficiently with the clerk offices because the deadlines were like two, three weeks. You just can't do that with the court on COVID, right? Because it's all remote. They're, they're backed up. They're hearing cases from last March to hopefully, again, we don't know yet how it's turning out, whether there's going to be political influence in that because we it should be non-affiliated politically, but it is an agency of the federal government anyways. But ultimately, they're becoming a rep. Purge, if you're you know, listening to us, watching us, write us a comment. We would love to know how many of our listeners uh, are impacted by this because it's, it's hard to tell. Uh, I know there's... I will say it's been a lot. It's been a lot. For me personally, four weeks. So I started about zero text messages, had some social media stuff, but I got done it. And then I'm back to like craziness right. today. <laughs> right. Well, th- yeah, definitely. So it is a lot. Leave, leave a comment. We would love to hear who is affected by this and just your story. Um, so if you're watching us on Facebook, on yeah. YouTube, on Instagram, uh, leave a comment and we would love to uh, yeah. find answers. And we have some great sponsors. They've done a lot of work for, with us. And not only they've not only have they... Uh, contributed financially they also a, a lot of them actually get out there and, and do a little bit of work that w- with us which is a a lot of help so some of the ones that oral and then lily uh has been a great contributor for a while as well not only is she's contributing she's also uh doing a lot of the work so thank you lily for that yeah, we appreciate it and, is a good cause. and we, we couldn't have done it without our sponsors so so if you're listening to us and are interested to learn about how you can be the next sponsor uh, we always look for sponsors, so just reach out to us on Instagram, Facebook, uh, directly to us, um, and we would be happy to connect and see how we can benefit you. But most importantly, if you believe in this cause, that's that's number one thing. If you believe in this cause and you want to see it. Yes, and I get a lot of, how can I pay you? Because I do this for free. I should mention that. So I don't do this. I help people literally free just as the time I really allows, and it's so doing greater work beyond. Because if we're not politically engaged, um, Honestly, we're going to see COVID mandate too and yeah. any virus mandate you can name exactly. if, if there's going to be no engagement in politics exactly. and there's not going to, there's not going to be enough lilies. Right, right. <laughs> can you briefly, uh, so you, you're obviously doing a lot, a lot of these mandates or you're, you're helping to get, uh, get around these mandates. Uh, what are the, some of the results have you seen briefly? Oh yeah, I actually got, I get daily and it's so good. It's either an email or a call and it's so awesome. I love people that call. So there's hope. There is absolutely. Um, it's a case by case. Honestly, it's, would it's, you say 50% get approved or more? Goes up with me. So I wouldn't know. I will say people that are in clinics have a higher chance and most of them get it. People that are in hospitals, as a clinical staff, most likely are not as successful because there's no accommodation. The other part that I want to address is once your employer accepts it, there has to be an accommodation. However, how do you accommodate a nurse, right? You can't. She can't do shots virtually or yeah. virals, right? But a scheduler can do the job from home. So administrative staff is a little bit more likely but a medical assistant, because of the nature of their job, it's not accommodated. I had a case, though, I will say, of a gal who was a nurse, and she did not 
de- you know, declined and um, applied for, put you on administrative leave. And so she was like totally cool with it. And she said, hey, offer me an alternative position. I'll take anything you've got that can be work from home, right? So um, HR said, okay, we will keep you in mind. Um, she was, she called me and t- described the situation. I said, well, th- was there any you know, things I can see because I see the date of the postage? And I said, interesting. I was like, well, go ahead and follow up with your HR and say you saw this listing and it's a remote position and you're willing to accept it because yes, it'll be $25 an hour and not 45 They aired um, and realized that not only was this nurse willing to she was looking like she wasn't going to let go um and i connected her with with pacific justice institute who was able to assist her which was really awesome but essentially what's now happening is employers are really trickily starting to not just lay out they just don't even want to offer comment ask the question so if you are getting let go from your clinical staff and there is administrative remote position so one asking that question two making that search right because this nurse would have never discovered unless she went and looked and what opportunities were available that obviously so i'm already starting again policy change um again there's just no way they can replace the workforce in that quick manner there's just no way unless they're bringing people out of state and relocating them here there's no other option really um so Again, every success story has its own. Um, And I will say, I also have seen folks submit the same letters and one gets accepted, lawyers and HR teams that are working for them. So let's give them credit and doubt that they're not doing this off air, like just off of just making up with it. So when they're seeing the same letter submitted by three same folks and it's copy and paste, they're obviously questioning, right? Is it a sincerely held belief, right? Or... Is it just something you're copying and pasting because it was successful for the other person, right? They're keeping track of it. So I encourage everybody listening. If you are, I know we have sample letters out there and I have myself one I've shared with people, but I always tell people modify to yourself, you know, really look at it from a perspective of what, what is it describing? You know, um, what, what is it saying? If it's truly close to it, still modify. Not everything's going to be up to how you believe it. There's clear. Obviously, if it's a church letter, it's going to be a standard. It's going to be the same for everybody. But if it's a member letter, um, and I'm talking about the religious exemption one, um, modify because you will get a no most likely um, and might not get a chance for appeal. I didn't help them. They come back to me and we're working through an appeal. I do this for students all the time. Appeal is your great opportunity for a better success. It's like you're you're given a second life. So do your best describing, verifying, really putting your point out there. No, I had an appeal. There's always an appeal, right? You file a court case and you don't win. There's an appeal court, right? There is also an appeal process. Every employer is needs to, not always going to offer it, but you have to inquire, do that employee. Yes. Um, and then for others, really smaller, more independent, private, I would say it's more successful. Private businesses are a lot more successful than public. And isn't that, and that doesn't surprise me, right? And shouldn't you, because right. profit versus loss, right? There right. is a gain or loss for them. And they understand what losing uh, three or four employees. So private sector, I am noticing is taking a little bit of a different approach. They're doing questionnaires before. So I have seen people come back and say, hey, should I fill this out? And all they're doing is asking. And we saw this really great case of a, so employee came back and made a modification. And we're accepting religious exemptions. Um, because they realized 40% was going to be a lot, right? So yeah. private sector is a lot more successful. I do. And it's very easy, so much more easier than public. Right. Peace Health has been a little bit difficult though, right? They're a public nonprofit. Right. Yeah. They're, they're, they're interesting. They're also faith-based, which adds yeah. on a little touch to that, right? You have God everywhere in the clinic and the hospital, but yeah, they're very, and they're, they're willing to risk that. So wow. it, it's, yeah, it's definitely sure. And it's Slavic. Right. Um, so it's that's why I know them because it's it's unfortunate, but you know it's it's going to be a little bit of time. I think we just got to wait it out. Patience, right? Something I'm never good at, but time will tell. And I think people just, if you're willing, you, you know, do as much as you can applying for those exemptions, whether they're medical, religious, or you know, trying to stay remote. Um, do your due diligence, asking the questions, you know, getting that legal support consultations, and if all fails. I will say this, it's okay to make that because it's a tough decision, right? I've heard a lot of stories, for example, New York is a state that no longer has any exemptions, period. 
they do not accept. There's five states now that do not. Um, so New York is one of the states that really became difficult and I've had people won't allow to graduate and does not know whether he's going to have a job, right? And at that point, you realize like you just sometimes you might have to give in right. and that's the situation mm -hmm. you're in. So I will encourage people, anybody that gives in. I had um, a pastor call me and he was like very concerned about the fact that um, his spouse was, you know, unfortunately took had to take a first shot. <laughs> And I find it so hard to, for people, like, we have to realize we do our due diligence and everything, and attorneys can only do so much. I can only do so much. But if people have to do it because you really have no option and, you know, you've done everything you can and hopefully you're trusting God to lead that decision, I, do, I think it's just being faithful because it's so tough. And I know what it feels like because I'm, you know, I talk with a lot of students who are my age and it's just like, you know, they've worked for a career their whole life, and now they're told you have five months left, but you can't do clinicals. Right, right. And before we get a bunch of emails uh, regarding, you know, that we're for vaccine or anti-vaccine, you know, we're, yes. we're, we take a very neutral position on this because it's a very personal mm -hmm. choice as well. So um, as a nonpartisan organization, we, we kind of keep that for individual person Absolutely. to decide and that's th and that's why we're so vocal because we believe in the, in the choice yep and when the government uh, takes such a position where they don't give you a choice that's when it becomes an issue yep so that's why we're so vocal about uh this particular issue and we want and to i will on. say it's a big issue for the community so yeah. um i you know i've not been involved with it personally and i also am not like i've haven't had to get a vaccine i'm you know or do anything of that I haven't had you know, I, I get the flexibility and freedom and I'm super grateful for that. But it also doesn't mean other people aren't going through it. So I'm always still sympathetic and I help people regardless, you know, um, of what their decision is and what their status is and what they have to do. But I just want to encourage everybody that just do what you can with trust and it, it will be OK. Right. Like we will see positive results and vote. Right. Like if you want to see positive results at the end of the day, I say we met, messed up somewhere, and that is we weren't voting the last five, ten years, right. and so that's where why we're here. Well, that's a perfect segue to my <laughs> our next kind of topic, uh, and we we don't have a lot of time to get into more of the questions that we had, but you know, voting that is that exactly exactly right because we're in this situation because our community uh, as Christians uh, mm -hmm. in, in general, the Christian community, in in, in general, just the, the people have kind of let uh, let go of this particular civic duty and haven't done their due diligence to vote. And we're in this situation for yes. that reason. So uh, I always kind of, I'm a, I'm a, I try to be patient. And I so what I believe is, you know, we can't just overnight or over one year change our government or change things to better. So it's gonna take a few years, maybe 10, 20 years in order to reverse a lot of this damage. So we have to really understand that and start with starting to vote, starting to actually get involved and run for local office. So those are the things that we always talk about. Uh, yes. But in your situation, you know, what are you seeing, you know, the next election that's coming up? Obviously, mm. that's going to have a lot of really important local positions that could possibly influence uh, some of these things or at least help in some ways. So the election that's coming up in November 3rd this mm -hmm. year, uh, there's going to be a big one in Washington, a smaller one in Oregon. But nonetheless, it's very important. What would you say, you know, tell us a little bit what are we going to be seeing because a lot of people yeah. might not know about it. Yes. Oh, my gosh. If I can say vote, vote, vote. Um, I will talk about Washington. We just had three local cities, counties. We have Yakult. No, not Yakult. Cowlitz, which is like Woodland, Yakult, that type of area. Um, they created what is called a um, they created a document. Um, and in fact, what they've done is they've said in their boundaries, you don't, there's no mass mandate. There's no vaccine mandate. That's power of local government right there. The fact that the government was able to come up with something, Battlegrounds next. So apparently there's conversation, they're going to take a lead and doing something very similar, which means if you're an employer within those boundaries, if you're an employee, if you have local government stepping up and telling to the state government, no, we're not going to abide. Within our boundaries, this is our law. That's going to be incredible. We're yet to see what that's going to do because I am sure that the state is not going to be behind by doing something crazy or we'll see. But that's, I mean, power of local government, so incredible, right? These are the individuals that are your city council. These are your governors. These are your 
school boards, right? If you've got a school board that's saying um, kids must wear masks, but if you've got a school board that's saying, hey, there is, there's really not good research. We're seeing some really health impacts. We're seeing a lot of outcry from parents. This is what we got to do. We see that across the country, right, as well. So when we're talking about local government, we forget how powerful they can be in things like education, in things like you know, mandates, as we see right now, and things like businesses or taxes on businesses, a lot of those are still held at the local level. So the more we vote for the people that align with where we stand as an individual, as a community, the more what we're going to see is Cowlitz County, the more we're going to see is battleground, right? We're going to see voting down of sex education, we're going to see school boards really coming out. I don't know if you've heard, but the really great case in Ohio, where a mayor came to the school board and he said he gave him two options yeah gave him two options said you resign or you're going to get a legal punishment you're you're going to prison that was a very powerful video it is and absolutely but that's the power of a mayor yeah right there local level that is not a government that was an ohio governor even though who is pretty conservative i would say he probably would have done something but not as bold but that's a power of a government coming to a school board and saying you have two options and that's it and he Right. Ends the conversation there because he's heard from parents. He's heard from people. He's been voted in there to represent those parents. So that's where we stand as far as local elections come. Right. Really approach it with can this mayor make a difference for me in my schools, you know, in schools? Can this mayor can I contribute to a great candidate? great person who then will serve me to make sure I have the freedoms that I want to make sure that I live in a place that is truly a good place to live, great place, right? That's where you want to approach this election, is thinking about that. And if you're seeing these examples of school boards, you're seeing these people make bold moves, it's local government. Right. And that's where we got to be at. Right, for sure. For us to start, we got to start at local government. So you, what you will see, essentially, like I said, we're going to see governor candidates, council, boards. Again, these are very critical for the issues we're currently experiencing is local level. So when, we got to vote. When are we going to see on the ballot Lula Zhukova? Um, yeah, you know, you probably won't see me. You won't see me for a little while to represent people. I don't like um, issuing things, but I like to help people. And I think you don't really get to help people in positions like that. And and that's my personal perspective, because I also come from political background, is because you're so there's the bureaucracy is so powerful. It's so hard to navigate. And I'm a person who likes to see success, right? So when I sent off that letter, and the person comes back to see, hey, I got the exemptions, that's right there, direct success that I contribute to. And I feel great that I did something good. When it's a little bit in politics you don't get to see that direct but it's for everybody different right it's just that's a personality i'm with i love to help people on the ground so i'm more of a person where you come to me and i'll take your case and we go to court and i represent and we win right, right. that's more of my perspective and i feel like that's the beautiful journey is that dima's in politics right you're gonna run hopefully give me good laws so that when i get the clients to represent it's really easy for me <laughs> um but that's the beauty of it. everybody in the community we all have a role to play and so so people that feel it's their it's their place, they need to step up and get there. However, let's not forget things like Slavic Vote, right? It's an organization. So let's also join efforts like these. We might not all be politicians, but we can all contribute somehow, either financially through labor or running for office. Right. Well, and, and I think like myself, you know, I'm not a politician. I never thought about running, but mm -hmm. sometimes uh, you have to step up and do the, the work. So, yes. so if, if you're listening uh, to us, uh, you know, video, audio, and you have thought about it, I, I do encourage you at least reach out to us and we'll be happy to uh, counsel you in any way we can. Because um, some of us did run and we learned the process a little bit and Lily is more than happy to give you some advice as well, I think. Yes, and uh, I'll say do run. So I'll correct myself. Don't be a politician. We need people who are not politicians. Right. However, I know if you won, Dima, two terms, you would have become a politician, right? So that's where the great beauty of the way the Constitution and government is laid out is essentially there is a re-election every two or four years, right? There's a term, and then you're supposed to be out, hopefully, right. if you're there for too long, right? So I say... If everybody's able to run, yes, we need more non-politicians to run, but also those people need to circulate. We can't right. have the same people um, because that's where the trouble comes, right. right? But yes, if everybody has an opportunity to run, um, do you run and hopefully you win and get into that position and so that you're helping people right. in the greater and way. And you're talking about term limits. 
Because yes. that's definitely important. I believe yes. in term limits. I think that's great. And it's really rare to see uh, politicians or folks who won who actually abide by that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know there's a few. There's one person, one particular representative from South Carolina. I, right now, the name kind of slips my mind, but he's he's done that. He's ran for, I believe, for two terms. And then he stepped back and decided not to run. And he was very powerful. And, and that's the goal. It's the way the founders really framed it is they the terms meant you would circulate and intentionally as i'm reading the federalist paper they wanted you to lose right. in your re-election really the goal but we've made politics be more about winning and re-election than anything else so we start you know as a candidate you start i mean up as a public official you start like campaigning before like while you're in office it, it's it's changed the way that we see it and 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 i will apply this even to good people even people that have been in office, the ideas need to change. We need to adjust because you lose touch, right? If you've been in politics for such a long, and even if you've done a good job so far, you lose touch, but your effectiveness, right? right. Um, because then people get used to you. They know you. They can know how you, they can manipulate you. They know how to get to you. And, and you ultimately are less effective right. as a candidate. So. Well, I think part of the problem with that, what you said, is we the people have stepped away from actually getting involved yes. And there's not enough good people running. And that's why there's people who are running for a re-election. And after a few terms, they kind of get into the, the swamp and they kind of don't want to leave anymore. Yeah. And no one else is running against yeah, them most exactly. of the time. So I think it's become we, the politicians, or we, the government. Absolutely. Yeah. If we can talk about specifically Slavic community, we, the people, were never there. I mean, I will not lie. I worked in politics and I never said that I was Slavic. No, I always hit that um, because of stereotype, but also it's because I didn't see representation. I didn't see anyone there. In fact, I think my friend and I, we were like the first Slavic interns like ever. Like it was really interesting, especially as women. And now we're seeing so much more of that, which is amazing. But it's like it's so uncommon. Right. And it's like if you tell people, they don't even know what it means. And so I think for us. For the Slavic community, we have to do so much more than just get involved. We have to really catch up because we've just done a great job of building wonderful churches. We've done a great job of building successful businesses, families. But what we haven't done is contributed, like understanding, like we drive on the roads. Do we even know how that's been paid for, right? A lot of people are like, well, how does education, like before parents, and we'll wrap up on this subject because I can go on and on, but before parents got involved with sex education, um, it was so interesting because the Slavics were like, oh, we paid for this? I was like, yeah, crazy. And I was like, in Washington State, at least, I can't say this for Oregon, because I know you guys, this is a little bit different. We rely heavily on property taxes to fund our education until McCleary decision in 2018. That flipped for us. But prior to that, it was always property taxes. The state never contributed to public education. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's tr- switched now. But essentially, what people realized is that the school districts were working for their money. Wow. And I mean, Slavic community ho- owns a lot of huge properties, expensive, beautiful homes that are high value property taxes. And they've been contributing to education while taking their kids to private or charter schools or homeschooling. Didn't even know that they pay for it. And until 2019, they were like, oh, wow, it's our money. Like I can go to the school board and like actually do something and get them fired because they don't they work for me under my money. So like that's a really huge realization. We don't know. So we got a lot of stepping up to do and realizing like not only do we pay for all of this through our tax you know through our hard work or our taxes but also we don't contribute on how much we get we are taxed on it because we don't vote or you know our ballot comes and we just put it aside um so as a community we have to like triple that we the people and just really step up because we will not gonna get success until we really step up yeah for sure. And that, that means getting involved, voting, number one, yes. uh, running for local office if you feel like you. And I believe uh, everybody uh, who, you know, has interest in it can run for something small. You know, you don't oh, you don't absolutely. have to, you know, definitely don't run for governor or, or like we see some people doing it. And if you feel like you can, I mean, if you're a businessman, you might be able to win. But we're talking absolutely. about everybody, right? Yeah. Oh, here's a person who set three years on a CNEC advisory. You don't even, you, you've got to join, yeah. but citizen noise advisory. Did you know that existed? Yeah, that was, that was an interesting, <laughs> uh, an interesting. Exactly. Committee. But I got to have an impact in my community, my Clark County community, right where I live. I got to impact 
what DBAs planes were flying, how noise, how loud things were. I got to be part of that, right? I went to Florida annually and got to learn about like what industry was changing and what could we do in the aviation, right? Um, in fact, COVID really impacted that, but that's an advisory that no one would have thought about, right? Right. But it's something that I got to do three years. I got to contribute. I got to learn a ton about the PDX airport that's right in my backyard. I got to learn that actually Washington contributes financially to Oregon. I always never knew that because I always thought it's out the boundary. But it's interstate commerce, right? It's federally funded. Funded. On top of that, it's because we utilize it, right? We're a sister state. We do utilize it. So our taxpayer money does go that. Would I have right. ever known? No. Right. And what Lily talking about, we talked about earlier was running for local office but then there's also different committees where you can yeah. sit on and those are usually you don't have to run for those you just uh, you don't have to get apply. appointed yeah you have to get time. appointed yeah but so. it's a little different yeah. and some of them you can even uh, i know that there's some folks you know some of them you can apply, apply and get yeah, nominated get and things like that so uh, yeah. definitely look out for those and reach out to us we can help kind yeah. of figure that out but uh, our time has come to a conclusion. I, I appreciate everybody who has joined, Lily. Yeah. Thank you Such for a good conversation. Thank you for thank coming. You. Um, and all of our listeners, thank you for uh, tuning in. Uh, all of our viewers, thank you for tuning in. You know, we're gonna we're gonna continue this conversation. I think with other folks, we're gonna have uh, so. Pastor Victor Lebedev. We're gonna continue our discussion uh, regarding the subject that we started last time, which was church and politics and church and state, and all that so kind sure. of tied together. So, and it's your pastor, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, and such an important topic. I'll have a podcast on that soon, but I get to work on a lot of that with pastors. Right. So yeah, it's it's been super important. It's been a very popular uh, episode. We had a lot of views, and it's obviously a very uh, you know a topic that a lot of people are really interested about. Yeah, because the Slavic community is faith based right. mostly, and you've got you know pastors not really knowing how to navigate right. that. And I think also as folks start following politics, they're wondering: Is this something that I can? get yeah. into and that's something that's probably people right. are listening to and wanting to right. figure it out is this something that they can do mm -hmm. so uh you can find those episodes on our youtube page on um some f facebook as well but most importantly go on our youtube page like our videos share them and subscribe mm -hmm. that always helps us and people call us and or ask us all the time how we can help uh obviously you know contributing as well but if you can't do money you can always share our videos share our content on facebook instagram uh, do anything you can. And most importantly, if you want to get involved, we're more than happy to. Uh, and that's that's when we talk about getting involved, you know, not only running for a local office, mm -hmm. you can also get involved with organizations like us where we could uh, we could do a lot of good. Yeah, ab absolutely. So the elections are coming up. Uh, are you planning to release some uh, resources for the community through SV Action? Yes, I hope to. You know, it, it's going to be a little challenging because I am so much more busier with exemptions, which is not anything I've ever done before. Um, and I also want to encourage everybody, if you're going through that process or considering it, just be hopeful. I mean, there are options. Um, and just ask those questions, reach out to people. I will say there is, I worked, I'm partnered with three firms and literally I, every day I'm like navigating people, which, you know, if they're local, I send them to one right. firm. If they're more, you know, depending on the issues, also the cases and stuff. But, um, so the hope is, yes, I will, because it is very important for people to know. I know Slavic community language barrier is one. So hoping to have a list out for folks um, is going to be right. vital. And we'll, we'll, have, uh, we'll either announce it or have it on our website, or uh, we'll, we'll try to get it out one way yes. or another if those are resources are, are available. And like I mentioned, uh, next program with, is with Viktor Lebedev, and then we're going to have a mayor, Lori Dreamer, or um, former mayor of Happy Valley, Lori Dreamer. She's going to be with us. She has an interesting story, and um, I think folks can look forward to that. Yeah. But anyway, thank you so much, everybody yeah, who's listening. Lily, thank you. Andre, thank you for having us. And Slavic family, thank you very much. And uh, we hope to see you guys next time. Thank you. Новости региона, выборы, кандидаты, стремления. Новая программа Славик Vote Life каждую неделю в прямом эфире. Славик Vote Life дает голос славянской общине по всему северо-западу. Мы говорим и информируем о важном Вашингтоне, Орегоне, Калифорнии по четвергам в 17:00. Присоединяйтесь к прямому эфиру на 10:40 а.м. Ищите Славик Vote в соцсетях. Мы намерены продолжать продвигать свое видение и оказывать любую необходимую поддержку сообществу, чтобы изменить ситуацию к лучшему. Славик Волт Лайф.